Hello everyone, today is Thursday, June 20th, 2019, and this is the week in charts. As usual, I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. I am honored by your presence, obviously. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off none or questions that aren't related to the slides until we get the live charts, and then hold off your stock picks, too, and that's for your benefit to make sure I actually see them all. And also, they don't get buried in other questions. I can't imagine we have a whole lot of setups today, given the nature or given conditions in the overall market, since we follow a pullback methodology. I want to get back to the TFM this week, and the reason is we had a few questions come in, and we've been talking about it quite a bit in the Q&A under the members area, but there are some points that I, I think are worth revisiting or visiting, however you want to look at it. And then I guess, obviously, where's winter? Okay, real quick, TFM system update. Let me give you the rules because I know if I don't, somebody's going to ask. You want to buy when the market is less than 10% away from its 50-week closing high and the last two-week close, and this is using a weekly chart, okay, or above the 50-week moving average. In other words, you have two weeks of Landry light. And then you want to exit. This is a long-only system. You want to exit when the market is 10% or more away from its 50-week closing high and the close is less than its 50-week moving average. So the exit is a little bit more lenient than the buy, and that's to get you out of the way as soon as possible. Now, when you're using a system for timing, and that system could be a pattern or something more, what word am I looking for, quantified, like we've done here with the TFM system, that signal remains in effect until and unless you have a defined exit or an opposing signal. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in just one second with the bow ties and then obviously with the TFM too. So the question came into the Facebook group. It was like, hey, Dave, and this was, this was last week, so we didn't have this week's bar yet. And it said, how could this be a buy when there's only one week of Landry light. So as we just saw in the rules, you need to have two weeks of Landry light. Well, the reason is because there was a previous buy back here, and that buy is still in effect. Notice that we had the two weeks of Landry light, and also notice that we were within 10% of the 50-week closing high, or less than 10% of the 50-week closing high, depends on how you want to look at that. Now, the reason I call it the TFM system, for those of you who don't know me, my nickname is the trend following moron, something that I wasn't very happy at the time. I was very hurt, and I stayed hurt for a few days because the person who called me that is a very famous person, and he was fighting the market while I was drawing big blue arrows, and that was way back in the late 90s, back in the trading market days, if anybody, anybody here remembers that. And I actually met this gentleman in New York, and we had a wonderful meal together, and he just was, he was enamored with me. He couldn't believe how I was following all these great trends and finding all these great trends. And then he began to confuse the issue with facts and started fighting them. Anyway, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but the point is, the reason I call it the TFM system is I wanted something that would just kind of be completely objective, or would be completely objective, I should say. And as long as the market is at or near new highs, keep me long. Now, where I'm going with this is, if you go back to technical analysis 101, technical analysis 101 states that if a market is at A, and it's going to C, and B is somewhere in between, so let's just say this is 10, 15, and 20. It's going to have to pass through B along the way. Now, 
as many of you know, I do have some IPO patterns that capitalize on this new closing high, or when the market makes a new closing high, I should say, called the buy at D. And then there's the other one that I've made public. The buy at D is made public, but only through the IPO course. The other one is similar to buy at D. It can get in a little bit later, and it involves a moving average. But the idea is the same. You want to buy somewhere around B. Now, with this market timing system, I was thinking as long as the market is somewhere near C, it's okay. And in order for the market to go beyond C, not to be confused with beyond C, it would have to get somewhere between D and C. So let's call this B plus or C minus, however you want to look at it. But as long as you're somewhere, as long as the market, let's just call it a B plus, as long as you have a B plus, then you want to look to get long or stay long. So just again, this is one of those little discoveries, just getting back to TA 101, just to try to prove a point that a simplified trend following system can actually work. And in this particular case, it does beat buy and hold. We'll take a look at the stats here in just one minute. So again, getting back to the question, how could this be a buy? It's not a buy, okay? I guess technically now it could be a new buy, but because we didn't get a signal after this last signal, in other words, a new sell signal in between, or an opposite signal, then this signal still remains in effect. Now, let's go back to what this would mean in something like a bow tie. So, in 2000, which makes a really great example, and uh, 2000 and... Seven was a pretty awesome example too. In fact, that's one that was really kind of cool because the moving averages had crossed over to downtrend proper order, meaning that the 10 went below the 20, went below the 30. 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. Early, early, early in 2008, everybody at Brother was like, what the hell happened to the market? It's like, well, if you're a a dumb little trend follower or a trend following moron, you would start seeing signals to the downside. And I know I've said it ad nauseum, but it just bears repeating, I think. I do remember back in 2007, late 2007, apologizing to my clients because the market was at new highs. I couldn't find a setup to save my life on the long side, but I had a plethora of shorts. So one by one, we didn't go crazy bearish, but one by one, we slowly began putting shorts on. So anyway, going back to the 2000 top, after you have that bow tie sell signal, which is just simply a moving average crossover followed by a little bit of a pullback. And right now, it's anybody new in here, I see a couple of new names. Welcome aboard. And I would just say, go to my website right now at this particular point in time. My books are for free. They won't always be for free, but it's just something I've been running as of late to get everybody up to speed. I'm working hard to try to get everybody up to speed on the methodology. Anyway, so this sell signal way back in 2000, early, early, early in that bear market. So if you see a sell signal like this, and this is a weekly chart, that sell signal remains in effect until and unless the market goes to new highs. Or another way of putting that would be with this particular pattern, if you have a bow tie down until and unless the market makes new highs, a major sell signal like this, then that pattern remains in effect. In other words, the top remains in effect. Now, it doesn't mean that you want to hold on for dear life all the way back to the highs. Your money management might take you out a little bit sooner. But if you're just looking at the signal in and of itself, that top remains in place until it either makes brand new highs or until you get a major signal in the opposite direction, which we did in 2003. The reason I like the 2003 signal for an example for a weekly bow tie is because the market took two years to bottom out and the moving averages were able to catch up with price and it made trend following a lot easier because everything caught up as opposed to the spike bottom we had in 2009. There was a lot of daily signals though and we began buying fairly early, but as far as the major signals on the weekly, they took a little bit longer to catch up due to the nature of the spike bottom. And I'll show you that in just one second. So the point is that the signal remains in effect, in effect until and unless you get a new signal. Now, getting back to the zoomed in chart, if you take a look at my ribbon at the bottom, in order for it to be bullish, 
you have to have a previous buy signal. And to stay bullish, it has to have two lows greater than the moving average, and you have to be within 10% of all-time highs. So if you get further than 10% away from all-time highs or you intersect the moving average, then it goes to neutral. So you can see in this particular case here, it didn't get further than 10%. This black line here is a 10% line. It didn't get further than 10% away from its moving at from the 50-week high, okay? But it did intersect with its moving average. So you can see that's why it went from bearish to neutral. So I kind of see that as a warning. Now, this right here is kind of cool. I discovered it by accident, as I do a lot of things, obviously. In the process of trying to teach, I thought it'd be kind of cool if I were to develop a simple little indicator that would just plot 10% away, or I should say it would plot 90% of the 50-week closing high. And it's kind of funny. And since I came out with this a week or so ago, I I was looking at some websites out there, and I noticed that some guy has some magical indicator that looks a lot like this indicator. He calls it red light, green light, and then the chart above is green, the chart below is red. And that looks pretty cool, and I'm, I'd love to know how he did it. He probably had a lot of programmers on staff. But anyway, for a fee, he will give you his signals. And I don't think he'll give you his formula, but he'll show you the signals. Anyway, I just the bottom line is there's really nothing magical out there. And simple stuff like this can work. And it amazes me when somebody shows you something that they claim is somewhat magical. And if you kind of boil it all down or just kind of look at it, it's actually something much, much, much simpler. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. Imagine that me. So if you take a look at what happened after it went neutral way back in November, you could see that you had a close below the 50 week moving average and also you were just a little bit more than 10 percent away from that closing high i'm getting some alerts here let me see what happened hang on sorry about that if you're watching a recording of this the market is crazy today i just got triggered in on a sox trade so you had the sell signal, and notice that you have to kind of squint your eyes, but notice that this close is below this line here. So you're more than 10% away from that 50-week closing highs, albeit just barely. And then notice the following week, it just kind of went straight back up, and then the signal went back to neutral. And it went to neutral because you were A, back above the moving average, and you were less than 10% away from all-time highs. Now, notice even though it went neutral, you still stayed, or it went back, I should say, the bearish territory. And again, this sell signal remains in effect until and unless you get a sell signal in the opposite way. So notice that it went neutral for a while because you got within 10% of that 50-week closing high, and then you got a buy signal, and then, it's kind of ironic. If you look at the last sell signal, the next week the market went straight up. So you were hurt and pop thinking, what the heck did I just do? And then if you look at this last buy signal back in March, the following week the market kind of, did, I wouldn't say imploded, but it sold off really hard. And notice that it went right back to neutral because you intersected the moving average. And then the other way it'll go neutral is if you're above the moving average, but you go more than 10% away from the closing high. And notice that it stayed mostly bullish since, and it did go back to neutral when we crossed below the moving average, and then now we're back to bullish mode. But this wouldn't be considered a brand new buy at this juncture because the buy was way back here. And we'll take a look at that spreadsheet in just one second. So you can see you went from buy to a warning to relax. I know, haha. -ha. Back to a warning and then back to relax. So it's really interesting when you look at it much, much, much longer term and notice the green line, as long as you're above it, stay bullish, okay, or look to buy, I should say, and as long as you're below it, stay cautious, possibly even look to sell short. So if we go back and look at this, you could see that from 2000 on down, it became bearish and it was neutral just for like a week or two. 
but for the most part, it stayed bearish the entire bear market. And then noticed it never did go bearish again for a long, long time after that 2003 signal. And it stayed either bullish or neutral, slightly neutral, just for a little while. I should say the neutral periods were very small in between. And then in 2008, it obviously went bearish again. And it stayed bearish for that all the way through that big slide. It only went neutral for a very small period of time. And then, of course, a little late to catch up, but it did eventually catch up. It went bullish, and then you had a little bit of whipsaw in there in 2010. And I'm going to flesh that out in just one second. It went bullish again, and then you had a little bit of whipsaw again in 2011. And then you had the mother of all runs from... 2011 to 2015, and it went neutral a couple times, but not much or not long. And then you had a bear move in 2016, or turned bearish, I should say, which turned out to be just a whipsaw. But obviously, you didn't know that at the time. And again, I'll flesh that out in a little more detail in a few minutes. And then, of course, it went bullish again from 2016 on. We did have another sell-off, which again, I'm gonna talk about in just a second, which turned out to be a whipsaw, sort of. I, I almost put a question mark in there. I guess in perfect hindsight, it was a whipsaw, but back in 2018, it sure didn't feel like a whipsaw or look like a whipsaw at the time. And then of course, we're back in the bull mode. Now, like death and taxes, there will be whipsaw. And this is where I always quote Greg Morris. He came down a few years ago before Christmas. He was on his way to visit his family in Texas. And we got to talking about markets. Of course, we got to talk about markets. And he said that whipsaws are frustrating. We, we kind of led into the conversation talking about the fact that the market lost 50% a couple of times over the last 20 something years. And, you know, unless you're retired two months before that happens, you could be a really hurt and pop. And as Greg said, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. So you could see that even though there were a few whipsaws, I think that if you didn't exit on those whipsaws, and I put whipsaws in quotes because you don't know a whipsaw is a whipsaw until after the fact. And this is especially true in 2016 and 2011. And even in those other ones I showed earlier, uh, I remember back then seeing a lot of sell signals, getting a lot of short setting up. And obviously, some worked, some didn't, but they weren't obviously longer term trend plays. But as a trend follower, I think you have to be prudent. So I think if you didn't exit on the whipsaws, especially in 2016 and 2018, then you're pretty much delusional. And this market has really rewarded the buy and hope crowd for a long, long time. And as I often say, that'll work until it don't. And if you don't believe me, go back and look at 2000, go back and look at 2008. And then of course, we'll have another bear market sometimes in the future. When? I don't know. But it pays to be prudent. I was thinking this morning, as the market's busting out the new highs, I got an email about a year or two ago, whenever. And this was back like, in, I forget when, maybe 2015 or something. It, He's like, you've been pounding the table being bearish for months. Have you thought about another profession? And I'm like, yeah, every time I get a, a turd like yours in my inbox, I really think long and hard about what I'm doing. And I guess where I'm going with that is you just you'll feel like such an idiot sometimes when that market doesn't sell off or if it sells off in a small way and just becomes a whipsaw. Well, that's just light and you have to learn how to live with it. And what's the whipsaw song by Sakoda? If you get bored, look that up on YouTube, or if you get a chance, look it up on YouTube after the show, of course. You, know, you get a whip, and I get a saw. One good trend play, pays for them all. I think that's how it goes. He actually sang that to us live. He brought his little banjo, whipped it out, sang it to us live at one of the AAPTA meetings. It was pretty cool. Anyway, I wanted to do an update on the spreadsheet and point out a few things to you. And also kind of beat the dead horse in a few things, too, because I think it's worth beating. <laughs> so you'll notice here I put diaper change. The diaper change 
is the big market sell-offs that would have been avoided. So, for instance, the system exited in October of 2000. And by the way, I'm not trying to sell you on the system. It's free anyway. But I'm trying to just point out that something simple can work in trend following and work quite well. You exited on October 13, 2000, based on this system. And you actually did have a small loss. Okay, well, it happens. But notice that the low of the move afterwards was 77.5. So you got at the market at 13.74. You lick your wounds with about a 4% loss, okay? And then the market goes on to go as low as 7.75, losing 44% of its value after your exit. Now, you're not going to get out of the exact top. That's not what trend following is all about. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works, as Beatrice would say. And back to back, your next exit was on January 11, 2008. Look how amazing that is. It just amazes me that weekly signals, I know I'm a nerd, weekly signals were triggering in January of 2008. If that doesn't get you excited about some of this simplified trend following stuff, then, then you're not a nerd, I guess. I don't know. But notice that what happens next, okay, you made 48% of the trade, better than the poke in the eye, right? And then the low of the move, which you completely missed because you got out of the market at 1400 and change, 666 was a 52% drop, which reminds me of the saying that at some point in your life, and you might want to write this down, Every asset class will lose half of its value. So at some point in your lifetime, every asset class will lose at least 50% of its value. Don't believe me? Well, the stock market of the last 20-something years twice has lost half of its value. Okay? I mean, the NASDAQ in, in 2000 lost 70-something percent of its value. Real estate lost half its value. I think in, was it 2008 or whenever it was? So every asset class at some point in your lifetime will lose half of its value. And that's the problem with saying, oh, well, let's just invest for the long term. And it makes me nuts when I see these people on Facebook act like they should. Maybe twice in my lifetime, there you go. <laughs> twice in my lifetime too, now I'm becoming such an old fart. Anyway, last buy signal you got in, in back in March, okay? And then I've got the days counted down here. So it actually turned bullish and created a buy signal on March 3rd, I'm sorry, March 1st, 2019. And it's been in for 98 days since. And I got to make sure that number is correct. Oh, you know what? It's actually been in longer than that because this is wrong here this should be obviously today's date so add a couple of weeks to that so 100 and something days and so far on that signal it's up four percent okay now i didn't go bullish i didn't personally get bullish on that signal because there were i saw some stocks setting up on the downside i saw some sectors that didn't look so hot and i didn't even know there was a bull signal a buy signal, I should say, until I logged into Facebook and, and you guys were talking about the system and, and asking whether or not it was a buy sig system signal. And I'm like, no, there's no way. And then I looked and I'm like, wow, it, it's a buy signal. And I was kind of amazed because I was so bearish, I couldn't figure out how in the world, or I thought there was no way in the world, I should say, that this thing would actually trigger a buy, but it did. Just real quick, I think I kind of beat the dead horse on a lot of this stuff too much. You can't beat it. What's I had a client in his Marine drill sergeant said, you can't beat a dead horse, but you can flatten it. And so I do flatten the dead horse quite a bit. But to recap, again, I think the most important thing about a system, not so much the bottom line, not so much the percent correct or whatever all these system guys freak out over, but more importantly, What's the diaper change look like, okay? 
And in here, you've got a 10% and there's 11% right here. And like I said in prior weeks, that's a pretty big number, 10%. So you got a half a million dollars in the market, you lose $50,000, depending, depending on what you make a year, that might take you a long time to make up with wages. And I remember last December, I was getting phone calls from friends and relatives and other people about the market and they were saying, well, I put so much, I put 10 grand in my 401k and I'm down 10 grand. So it's like, that's a 20 grand swing. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's what happens in markets if you're a pure buy and hold person. Now, obviously it worked out and I don't want to digress too far, imagine that. But the problem with, again, the buy and hold is it'll work until it don't. And the market is a very bad teacher. Stop if you heard that before. And my example here was when I was moving a few months back, the in the U-Haul place, the guy I had on CNBC, and I told the guy that I dabbled a little bit in the market. I didn't say, I'll get a website, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um, he said, man, am I glad I held on through December. I only wish I would have bought more. He was bummed out that he didn't buy more at the lows. So that poor bastard, the next time the market begins to implode, he's going to catch that falling knife. Okay. Any questions? As far as buy and sell signals, how do you approach new system when you have contrary moves and at Q's, S&P, Dow, and Russell? Well, okay, it's an interesting point because the market, it's like putting together pieces of a puzzle. And I'm kind of shocked that we gapped to all-time highs in the S&P this morning, and I'm fading that gap, Just, but I'm not going to hold overnight. Don't worry. This is just a little opening gap reversal play, but that's just one piece of it. So this signal has a buy. You might have mixed signals throughout. So it's like I'm not super bullish, even though the market may do highs, because I think the semiconductors still are in trouble. I think the stock, the, the transports still might be in trouble. Internet still might be in trouble and a few other sectors in here. So I don't think it's all great just yet, just because the S&P may do highs. But if you're using this one little piece, this one little piece might begin to wake you up to say, hey, hey, Dave, stop being bearish because, go back to be a, T, a TFM, because the overall market is actually doing better than you might think. Base is the S&P 500. I should rephrase that. The S&P 500 is doing better than some other areas. And maybe you can begin to think, okay, maybe the S&P will lead us out of this. I will tell you this though, I did, I've, I've got order, I've got resting orders in and I, I exited a, a half a position this morning because it hit the profit target. I am selling into this with both fists, not because I'm, I'm super bearish, but because that's what my system is telling me to do. And I am, I guess I am mostly long if you don't count the fact that I, I had, do have one short position. Okay, a couple of thoughts. So did that, act, did that answer your question? You just have to use it as a clue. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Okay, random thoughts regarding the TFM system. This is something that I was talking about over the last month or so with the Dave Landry members in the Q&A. And as I just said, I'm getting a little further ahead of myself. It's just another tool, okay? So it's a puzzle piece, if you will. But it could be the start of something bigger. And one of you guys in the Facebook group has kind of taken the ball and ran with it. And uh, I hope I got my tense right on that. My wife will correct me if she overhears me, I'm sure. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and that's been kind of fun to watch unfold. And I gave him a little congratulations this morning. That's Jim, if you're in here. Is Jim in here? And so again, use it as a puzzle piece. If you're under a buy, then focus on the long side, or I, sh I should say think about being long. If you're under a sell, then you want to be selective on the long side, okay? And then for the more advanced, you might consider shorting. Now, a lot of you have asked me, can I use this on individual stocks? Well, that's where it gets a little tricky. My designer's intent for this was for the overall market. And it is a little slow to turn. And I sort of put that lag in there. Not that I put the lag in there, but the lag is allowed. And I didn't try to... I didn't try to get too much lag out because I think that's when you start grail hunting and it gets a little dangerous. You want a little lag in a market timing system because a market K 
can be really choppy, as you know. If you put too much, too many filters in there, I think you can end up with even more whipsaw. It's ironic, the thing you're trying to avoid, you can end up with more of it, or you can end up with a system that just doesn't work, gets you in way too late. Anyway, back to the designer's intent. It was for the overall market, and the 10% is based on the general overall market volatility basis, the S&P 500. I figured 10% would be a good round number. If a market drops more than 10% away from its 50-week closing high, it could be in trouble, okay? If a market gets within 10% of its 50-week moving high, it might be improving. And I'm not a big mechanical guy, as you know, I'm a discretionary trader. I like to put all the pieces together, but it does give you one little mechanical piece that you could say, well, this for a fact is a buy signal. I noticed the other day, I'm kind of bearish on the semis. I, somebody else out there I respect was kind of bullish saying, hey, they're coming back looking good. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I don't see it yet. But if you have something like this, that's a little bit more mechanical, or in this case, 100% mechanical, It'll let you know that, well, it, based on this one system, it has gone back to bullish. So anyway, if you were going to use this on some other market, you would have to figure out what the volatility of that market would be. I'm not sure if it'd be a great thing to use in stocks, individual stocks at least, and especially it's something like a biotech because a biotech might move 20% in one afternoon. So anyway, just some food for thought on that. So again, for individual stocks, I would prefer using something like my core methodology. For IPOs, I would like my, I would prefer, let me rewind that. For IPOs, I would prefer using something like the pioneer patterns and then of course the core methodology after those first few weeks of trading. So again, just use this as part of your analysis if you like it. If you don't like it, then go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. All right, the question is, is winter still coming? It doesn't seem like it this morning, does it? I don't know. I don't think we're over yet. We'll get to those charts in just one second. If you are a member of Dave Landry Members, and I, I hate to keep prodding you guys, I guess I'll send you an email to remind you, see if I can get a reminder, and uh, a sign of an email. Do join the Facebook group. It is for members only, so you have to be, it's free, but you have to be a member of DaveLandry.com to be in the Facebook group. And we've been having a lot of fun there. And my ultimate goal with this, as I've been preaching, is to create a mastermind group. Everybody gets up to speed by going through the courses. And then we go to Facebook and we kind of hash it all out. And it's been a blast. I've been having a blast. You guys have given me a couple of good stock picks. And I've put out a few okay stock picks too. So anyway, to join, if you're already in a member, just click on that link right there. It's going to ask for your email that you use to sign up, and then we can cross-reference you to make sure that you're a member. If not, I hate saying no, but I might say no. <laughs> I will say no. Anyway, point being that we have a lot of great discussions. This is just one of them when Pinterest came out as a buy it, be type setup. And also with this learning management system, it's like I, a few people say I beat the dead horse a lot, and I do, And and but one client in particular, I said the same thing about seven different ways, and then one day he calls me up, and I said it an eighth different way, and like a light bulb went off, and he finally got it. So and the, the other thing with that particular client, too, was he didn't know one particular aspect of my money management, and I thought I had said that ad nauseum. So by putting it to an, a learning management system where we can track the progress, we know if a piece may be missing from your education vis-a-vis -vis my methodology. Anyway, I'm a nerd, but I'm pretty excited about all this stuff. And there's a lot of bonuses that come along with it. I'm not going to go through all that and bore you too much. No, no, too late. Okay, we have an invisible chart here. All right, let's take a look at the S&P 500. Sorry if my mic goes uh, quiet every now and then. <laughs> I'm um, keeping a loose eye on the market. Not that you should watch the market, not that you should watch every tick. The point is that you should have orders in place, and that's why I'm watching to make sure I don't have to place any orders. All right, let me show you what happened, and let's use the spiders as an example. I was caught off guard a little bit this morning because my futures contract didn't roll 
and it wasn't showing the market up this big so i was really focused on the weekly charts and then the market dings and then i see the s p gap in way higher i saw the spiders were up but i didn't do the math and see that they were up so big well so far we've got an opening gap reversal here i know they ain't over yet let's not start kissing each other just yet but i think when you see a gap that big to all-time highs, it's worth trading the open and gap reversal. Now, it's a little bit more advanced, but what you do is you can let the market open, and if it doesn't make that immediate huge reversal on the open, which makes your life a little easier, then you can put in a stop order to short the market below that opening range. Now, I do like these. I hate these for longer-term trading, okay? But for shorter term trading, these inverse ETFs can be really fun, at least for a day trade. I wouldn't hold them longer than that. So we'll see what happens. But I did trigger in around here on this particular one. If it goes back to new lows, then I'm wrong. I have to get out the way. And then I have a profit target up here. If I'm right half, I will exit. Or if I'm right, I'll exit on half. And then I'm a travel stop on the remainder. Not enough time to get into this today, but there are automated ways of doing that. We discussed that yesterday with a couple of walkthroughs, or one walkthrough in particular, in the Q&A. So it's all in there. And I spent a lot of time talking about open gap reversals. So my intention is not to teach them today, but just keep an eye out for them, especially in something like the spiders, when you see these big old fat gap opens like this. So what happens is everybody in that brother rushes to buy, and it's kind of like a now what type of situation. Also, if you think about it, there's been shorts. I would imagine there's shorts out the wazoo trying to short this market because it doesn't make sense or it shouldn't be going up, whatever their reasoning is. And they rush in to cover or they get or the margin forces them out. Okay, you got to realize that that happens too. And they get squeezed out. So that buying happens early in, in early trading. But once that buying exhausts itself, remember, if somebody's short a market, that is pent up buying. And that's kind of a, you kind of have to wrap your head around that, okay? And they eventually have to buy. He's He would sell what isn't his and must buy it back or go to prison. Anyway, so that's the piece. As a trend following moron, I'm not going to argue with all time highs. As a trader, I question whether or not this is the all clear, at least just yet. Now, my big problem was if you've been paying attention to these presentations for a while, was we had this big old fat V shaped recovery at a high level. What does that mean? Well, it meant the market sold off and then went straight back up. Very hard for a market to go straight up for a long time, right? And that had me a little nervous because by the time you get all the way to new highs, you're already overbought. So we did have this correction in here, which looked like could be the start of something bigger. And then now we have like a mini V back up to the prior highs. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't keep going, but we're already overbought going into these highs. So I would be cautious. I would not rush out and buy stocks today. If you're long stocks, as you probably should be, because we have been seeing some opportunities here and there, at least at IPOs and things like that, this is a good opportunity to lighten up, provided, of course, you're hitting those additional profit targets. And I'll show you an example of that in just one second. In fact, I'll show you that right now, so don't forget. This was one we were long, and this kind of reminds me of the Y trend following is hard. We triggered in back here, and then went up a little bit, felt pretty good. Came back in, went up a little bit, felt pretty good. And then it's just been chopping sideways forever. And this position has been underwater for a long, long time. Well, I don't believe in dead money in the purest sense of the, of the word. Or the Dead money is like is a position that, sh that shows no promise of future improvement. Well, how do you know that it will show no promise of future improvement. If you knew it wouldn't show no promise ever, then yes, you should get out. But if you were not stopped out and you're following your methodology, then you should continue to follow along. I would be willing to bet a hundred bucks that 90%, maybe not 90 because my clients are getting a little smarter, but let's say 80% of the people 
who took this signal when I put it out probably exited long before today, okay? Now, we take partial profits because we don't know if that's all we're going to get. And you can see it's already come off those levels this morning. We, the IPT, I think, was around 26 or at 26 exactly on this one. And now your stop is at break even. So if this stock stays above where we got in, then we all continue to follow along. It's a good little trend of followers. If it comes back in and stops us out, then so what? I know you might have to drop an F bomb, but at least you got something out of trade, out of the trade. It's better than a poke in the arm. Every now and then I think, oh, I'm going to get cute because this might be the best trade in the world. And I find myself tempted not to take those initial partial profits. And I just kind of close my eyes and do it because it sucks. If that market keeps on going, sucks in a good way. <laughs> but you feel like, you feel like, dang, I could have left on that bigger position. Well, you just have to learn to live with the fact that your position is going to be smaller, even though you finally caught that elusive trend. You just have to live with it. And that's the hard part of any type of trading. It's hard to live through this. It's hard to take those partial profits at 26 and then watch it two seconds later go to 27. Okay. But you have to have a process and you have to follow those rules. Now let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ's kind of interesting in here because obviously we didn't get past the prior high and obviously we've got a pretty serious reversal underway. Now could the NASDAQ and the S&P and some of these other indices turn into a triple, triple top? Yeah, certainly they could. I don't trade directly off of big picture technical analysis, but if I get a bow tie after a double top or some other pattern after a triple top or whatever, then I might consider taking that pattern because I have that bigger picture technical analysis behind me. Learn all the big picture technical analysis, but apply it sparingly. Find some signals that will be a little bit more obvious because some of those chart patterns aren't always obvious and then back those signals with bigger picture technical analysis. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty gapped open this morning, but look at that. It's only up, up a little bit less than a half a percent. Okay, so it's given up some of those gains. My big problem here, as I've been saying ad nauseum, is you have this big thrust. You've got this retrace stalling well short of the prior highs, and then a new leg lower. Now, if we continue higher in here, especially we take out this little peak, then maybe we don't have anything to worry about that there. Okay, let's take a look at the semis. I've been really bearish on the semiconductors, and I really don't think they're out of the woods yet. That little alert that just went off a few minutes ago was me triggering in to SOXS in here. You can see so far it's been a little bit of an opening gap reversal. So getting back to the semis, let's take a look at that a little bit longer chart and see if I can flesh out what I'm saying. This is a four-day chart. So on a four-day chart, you can see that so far it's been thrust followed by pullback. I'm a big proponent or fan, however you want to look at it, of having the semiconductors go in the same direction of the overall market for confirmation. In other words, if the market's headed higher, I sure do like to see the semis also headed higher. The old school way of looking at the markets goes back to, I think it was Rhea with the Dow Theory, R-H-E-A, I believe is his name. And they focused a lot on the transports. And the, the thinking there was that the transports had to move the goods around. Well, there's still a lot of truth to that. I mean, how many, how many brown... Amazon boxes. Let me look around my office. Yep, I got three or four of them cluttering my office. You know how many how many of these Amazon? We got a dumpster in front of our house that's being built. My office is is being built as part of the house, and it's full of Amazon boxes. And I don't think that the materials came from Amazon, but somebody in the neighborhood I think is dumping all our Amazon boxes on us. So the point is, yeah, the goods are still being moved by transportation by transports by trucks, planes, trains, and automobiles. So there's probably some importance of that. But as somebody pointed out years ago when I made this semiconductor argument, is that the semiconductors or the electronic highway. Anyway, 
don't want to get too deep into that. But so far, I don't think the semis are really confirming what we're seeing. And so far, we have an opening gap reversal, at least on a micro, in the semis. So that's what I'm a little concerned about. Let's take a look at Internet's another one of these areas. Internet just doesn't look good at all. That looks like a big old fat short to me. Thrust down, followed by a pullback. All right, anyway, so even though overall market bases the P's at least, breaking out the new highs, and even the P's themselves, especially looking like the spiders, you can see so far stalling out a little bit in that gap higher. I still think the market could be in a little bit of trouble, but hey, if all the indices make it to new highs and the sectors start joining in the fray, then I'm not going to worry as much. I guess there's always something to worry about. Dave, I feel like if I was selling options or doing covered calls over the last three weeks, I would look like a genius. Individual volatility in stocks has been rising over the last month. Well, yeah, but then with the fact that the market went up, you, you would you would be called out of those positions and you would only make you'd be limited by your by what you made on the calls. Yeah, in, in selling options, I don't know, selling options is a quick way to have a very brilliant but brief career on Wall Street. So be really careful with that. And and the problem is it can work for a long, long, long time. Two drink minimum on stories here, but I've seen a lot of crazy things happen, believe me. And a lot of crazy things happen to me too. But that's beyond today's conversation. All right, you guys want to open up for individual stocks? Feel free to start punching those in now. I guess to those who are new here, if there's a stock you want me to take a look at for you, I'd be happy to do that now. Okay, bonds are still rising in cost. Do you factor that into market analysis? No, uh, I look at bonds, okay, to see what's going on. Bonds up means rates down, so that's probably a good thing. The thing about intermarket technical analysis as I preach, and I would encourage you, Murphy's book is as good as any, he actually wrote the first book, literally wrote, literally wrote the first book on intermarket technical analysis. I would encourage you to read it. The problem, and as Murphy points out himself, is that there's long lead and lag times. You can't trade off it. Now, I remember in the 90s, in the mid to late 90s, and maybe even afterwards, you can almost trade bonds off stocks and stocks off bonds and things like that there was a really good inverse correlation or positive correlation, whatever the case may be. I hear you though. So this is kind of cool that these bonds are breaking out to brand new highs in here, at least over the last year or so. So that means that the rates are low. So that means that you, it's going to be hard to chase yields or get any, get any income on bonds. So what do you do when this happens? Well, you go to stocks. Okay. That gets really complicated when you start doing all that intermarket technical analysis. I think it only matters when it matters. What's the dollar doing? The dollar should be tanking a little bit. See, when rates go down, the dollar goes down. Okay, when rates go up, the dollar goes up. So you can see the dollar's tanking a little bit in here, inverse to bonds. It's another way of looking at that. So it only matters when it matters, at least in, in more. Uh, modern day. But yeah, I do take a look at bonds here and there to see what's happening. And if bonds really start imploding, then I begin to get concerned. Pring has a really good model out there somewhere, a drawing where you have bonds topping, stocks topping, the whole nine yards. I forget what he calls it. It's kind of cool to look at, but it's really hard to actually time off of it. But longer term, it's kind of cool to, at least in history, go back and look and see how it all played out. So it, it will help you to not become a perma bull or perma bear by looking at that long term. I don't know if it's an economic cycle that it, it, it plays out, but looking at that long term bond cycle, bear cycle, bull market cycle. So check that out. Yeah, this is one I've been watching. This is one that's been on my momentum list. It just didn't pull back enough for my taste based on the volatility of it. Even though this is fairly extreme in here, I'd like to see even more of a knockout move. And it's kind of a little wide and loose, even though it took off. HV is up around 84. So, and, you know, maybe I'll regret this, but I've been real super duper selective as of late. 
And I saw this one, but I just felt like it needed more of a knockout move before going after it. The problem that we all have is we all tend to have a perceptual distortion, which sort of is a corollary with selective perception. And let's say this stock goes to 20 or 30, I'm going to probably be kicking myself in the butt for being so selective. But one thing that I do find myself making a note of, and I would encourage you to do the same thing, is to pay attention for when it doesn't work. And there's been a few lately that have absolutely imploded, okay? And that's made me feel a lot better by sticking to my guns and being selective. And this is kind of a, a similar example, but sometimes I'll see a stock that I was present uh, previously long and it'll be double or triple since I've been in it and I'll get bumped out. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that some of the stocks that I was previously long have halved or going to zero, okay? And that kind of wakes you up to the fact that you have to follow the process, even though it means there's gonna be some FOMO in there and feeling like you're being left behind. But you gotta be really careful on that. All right, Ota. <laughs> Months ago, I'm at, my, I'm at my physical therapist for all these repetitive injuries, and uh, he's like, you dabble in stocks? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he says, I'm in Ota. I'm like, oh, this thing is big. I, I tell you what, I've been tempted ever since just to jump in and buy some, you know, so if, if uh, next time I go see him, at least I can say I'm long with him. That, that'll that probably stop it from going higher. Yeah, you know, it's a momentum stock. Maybe on the next pullback, but right now it's just banging out new highs. I don't see any reason why you should go out and, and buy it. Okay, shop. Yeah, it's another one banging out new highs. Now, one thing I would caution you on this one, and this is the the price for perfection thing that I tried to explain yesterday. I'm not sure if it did such a good job. But look at the volume on this thing, okay? It's got a huge amount of volume. It's now 300 something dollars a share. And another way to look at that too is anybody's ever bought it is now happy and still holding it, obviously. But once they get this high, once they quadruple, or in this case, go up, what is it, 600%, 800%, 1,000%, and they have this much volume and this much attention, then a lot of analysts begin looking at the stock and it gets kind of put under a microscope. And that's what I mean by priced for perfection. So if this stock loses, doesn't beat earnings by a thousand percent or whatever, it's kind of, sometimes it can be the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It's kind of just the opposite of what I normally preach. But as I was explaining in the Facebook group yesterday, a stock technically with a trend following methodology is never too high to buy. So if you see a setup, then by all means take it. But I would just be a little bit nervous in this. I would prefer finding something at a lower level like that toughen IPO we just talked about a minute ago. You know, that might be in the early phases, I know might be the key word in that, but might be in the early, early phases of going to 300 as opposed to a stock that already made it to 300. The other thing too is my methodology isn't always a be all end all. You really didn't have at least the way I would just run out and trade it, you really didn't have these perfect little pullbacks that I'd like to trade in here. Like right here, I was looking for more of a knockout move that never happened, okay? So it's not a perfect methodology, and you have to be willing to let some things go. Like I think I wrote in the last column, unless you're Bill Cosby and you've got a bunch of roofies, <laughs> you can't kiss all the women. It's funny, I found a picture of him as Morpheus. Oh my gosh, IIPR. Yeah, this one looks fantastic as far as a momentum stock. It's on my momentum list. It needs like the mother of all knockout moves. It's kind of, you know, again, everything I just said about high price and all sort of comes into play. It's interesting that it's considered a, a real estate company, but look at that. But yeah, on a knockout move, maybe, or some sort of deep pullback. We'd have to have a deep, deep pullback for me to consider it. And I would also see if I could find something at lower levels first, but yeah, pretty nice. IOVA. Yeah, this one's, it had such a big gap. It was kind of wide and loose and then it was straight up and now it's got an HP at 93. It's a little dangerous. It would have to pull back, consider it would have to pull back almost to like 
where it broke out. And at that point, I probably would toss it out since it came back to the breakout point. So yeah, by all means, keep it on your momentum list. But for now, I think I would hold off on that NSSC, NSSC. Oh, wow, you're all over these momentum stocks today. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I want to pull back, absolutely. Again, though, getting kind of, it's already had a pretty good run. Not that it's ever too high to buy, but it does, I wouldn't say it trades cleanly, but it does trade kind of like a Darvis box type of stock. Well, I have to say, if we could figure out how to identify these box stocks ahead of time, we'd own the world. It just kind of like makes a box, makes a box above it, and just keeps on keeping on. The good thing is sometimes, and sometimes is a key word in that sentence, but sometimes my pullback patterns and TKOs and things like that can get you in these stocks and then the money management can keep you in if they do turn into a longer term Darvis type of stock. So if you're not familiar with Darvis, he wrote a book, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market. And it's not as hypey as it might, as it might sound, he was a dancer and he was given some stock because they couldn't afford to pay him for a gig and he kept the stock or whatever and it went up and then he began paying attention to price movement and by accident he became quite the technician and basically he was just looking for a stock to move from one box to the next and if it moved to the next box he would buy it and there's a few caveats in there and all. But yeah, do some Googling on that and read the book, How I Made Too Many Dollars in the Stock Market. I gotta find that book. All my books are packed away, they're in storage now, but I'm gonna dig it out and read it at some point. ELP, I just can't get over the stock. It's efficient, but man, it has been trading nicely. And I wanted to pull the trigger many times, but avoid it. Yeah, that's the that's the tough part. You have to make a decision like, can I walk away and be okay? Now this is a foreign utility, so it can be a little choppy here and there, but I hear you. You know, I'm not really seeing a whole lot of setups in here that you could have really could have jumped on. Maybe on the next pullback, it's it's you're right. The HP is a little low because it is a utility. Something bad could always happen. So you you've done the I can tell you've done all the mental masturbation on that one. But yeah, if it pulls back a little bit, by all means, I think it's probably okay now. Uh, the volatility has increased. But I hear you. Probably the volatility was probably really low before it actually made that move. And, you know, utility, Ugh, it's hard to get into. But look at that. That's kind of crazy. What country is this? Anybody know? Oh, you're welcome. Absolutely. Anytime. Okay, any more? Good momentum picks today. I need to verify I have all of my momentum lists, but I think I do. They all look fairly familiar to me. Okay, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, we'll do two things. One... If it requires a lot of thought, I'll put together some slides and either present in my Q&A for the members area, and I'll give you access to that week, and then, or two, we'll cover it here in the week of charts. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then, and hopefully see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. Oh, you too. You're welcome.